Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Topos Institute Colloquium. Um, thank you all for being here. And I am delighted this week to have uh, Alex Martinkovsky, who's going to be talking to us about how to interpret co-torsion. Um, and he said that, um, please feel free to enter any questions you have into the chat. I will try to keep an eye on them. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end. But if you have something burning and would like to interrupt, then please do. So Alex, please. So thank you very much for this invitation. Happy to be here. Uh, today, I will speak about uh, some interesting connections uh, between linear control systems and uh, functor categories. I just noticed that the person who introduced me to this connection, Mohammed Barakat, is in the audience. Hi, Mohammed. Hello, Alex. All right. Very well. Uh, and you introduced us to functor categories, by the way. So we thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's speak about linear control systems. And I'm no specialist in that field. Maybe I'm a couple of minutes ahead of you. Uh, so what is a linear control system? Well, this is just an underdetermined system of say linear differential equations. So that means that uh, some of the functions in the system are, are free. They can be chosen arbitrarily. And uh, the name for these free functions, well, they are referred to as the input of the system. And the goal of control is to uh, make a choice of the input variables such that that would guarantee a desired behavior of the system. Of course, to make a choice, you also need the an output. That is output. Alex, are variable. you currently uh, writing any notes? Because so far, all we see on the screen share is just the title. No. But oh. I will start writing immediately. Sorry, I just wanted to check. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, this is what I told you. Some of the stuff I will just speak, sure. the rest will be written. Sorry, thank you. Otherwise, we will not get into this 50 minute uh, schedule. Very well. So, mathematically, what does that mean? So, let's write down the system. So this is a system of differential equations. So, so who is who here? Well, X will be called the state of the system. U is called the input. And Y is the output. So that these are the variables. What are the A, B, and C? These are matrices of appropriate sizes. And the coefficients could be constant or polynomial or analytic functions. The base field will be 
the reals or complex numbers. And symbolically, very, very crudely, a system, well, here's the state of the system, there's an input and there's an output. Uh, sometimes these uh, systems are also called dynamical systems with input. So let's call this system sigma. And associated with this sigma is the dual system. It is defined similarly. What you need to do is you transpose each of the matrices A, B, C, and D, and also transpose the uh, block matrix. So the superscript T here indicates the transpose. So now we have introduced the original system sigma and its dual. So, so at this point, let's go back to calc one. And remember how we decoupled the notation df dx. So this was written in calc one as ddx applied to f. And so the symbol ddx acquires a life of its own. And similar to calc one, we look, we start looking at multivariable functions. And we now have the symbols D, D, S, I, which we call differential operators. And well, let's, let's assign the name. So these are differential operators. And the totality, totality of these differential operators form a ring, the ring D. Again, the coefficients can be chosen arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, but uh, as, as, as the situation requires. Now, once we have a ring of differential operators, this whole system that we started with can be rewritten as A X bar equals zero. Now this letter A and this letter X, they have nothing to do with the matrix A above and the letter X above. So we are in a new world. So these are different from, from the above, but that's the most compact way of writing a system of a differential equation. So A is a matrix. with entries in the ring of differential operators. All right. Now, what about X? Well, X, uh, should belong to a suitable class of functions. 
in fact, it should belong to a module of uh, the ring of differential operators. In other words, so think of X as an element of a module over D. And tautologically, tautologically because nothing has happened mathematically, let's just record a trivial observation that solutions of the original system are exactly the same thing as the solutions of the system three. Now, at this point, it is convenient to start looking at the solutions of uh, the last system, system three, not in, in a specific module, but in arbitrary D modules. What this means is that we're actually switching to a functorial point of view. So now, look at solutions of three in an arbitrary D module. So uh, let us try and think about the, the situation. So you give me a module and I look at the solutions of system three in that module. So what is it? Well, A is a matrix, X are the entries unknowns in the module. So what it is, is just a system of linear equations uh, with unknowns in a specific module. So when you pass from this system to the solutions, what do you get? Well, you may relate this experience to your linear algebra class and say, oh yeah, we'll get, uh, over there you got a vector space of solutions. And here it is tempting to say that we get a module, a demodule of solutions, but uh, that's not always the case. The issue here is that the non-commutativity in general of the ring D. And when you look for solutions of equations, linear equations over in a module over a non-commutative ring, the solution set is not a module. It's just an abelian group. And by the way, you can view this issue already for one by one matrices. Say if you have something like this R X equals zero. So X is an element of the module unknown and R is an element of the ring. Well, let's think about it. If you know X and you look at the totality of all R that solve this equation, you get what is known as the annihilator of the element. That's always an ideal, left or right, depends on how you write it. But if you fix R and look at the totality of all X that satisfied this equation, you don't get a module, you just get an abelian group. And it's exactly the non possible non-commutativity that prevents you from claiming that the solutions form a module. Okay, so all that brings about functors. So this matrix A 
brings us a functor S. Let's call it the solution set functor. So how does it work? S goes from modules over D to abelian groups. So for each D module, it returns the solution set of system three. And the basic result in this direction is that this solution space functor is representable. So the representing object is defined by a, an exact sequence so f1 going to f not these are three modules the matrix of this map is the transpose of the matrix of the system and as a result we get a certain module m Thus, the value of the solution space functor on a module L is just home um, from M to L. This isomorphism is known as the Malgrange isomorphism. Well, uh, let's take a look what we have done. We started out with a system and produced a module and that module is uniquely determined. Conversely, if you have a module, you can produce a system, simply take a presentation matrix and take its transpose. So now you can go back and forth between systems and modules. So let's go back to systems. So back to systems. Two features of any uh, control system are its controllability and observability. So what does controllability mean? Controllability means that for sigma C, that sigma can be uh, can be taken from any initial state. to any final state. By an appropriate choice of input.
And now we come to the first benefit of the module theoretic uh, perspective. Let me mention this fact. Sigma is controllable even only if the corresponding module M has no torsion. Now the uh, tor in, in general, when the system is not controllable, that means it has torsion and that torsion has a special name. Uh, the, uh, the name is the autonomy of the system. So the autonomy is the part of the system that cannot be controlled. So what about the observability? So the system is observable. If the dynamics of the system can be estimated based on the outputs only, or uh, simply said, if the state of the system Alex, there's just one question in the chat. Um, if you could remind us of the definition of torsion briefly. Oh, yes. I will Thanks. do that on the next page. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. And right now, uh, let's just keep this as an open question, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Great. Thanks. So a system is observable if the state of the system uh, can be recovered from the output. And now we have a theorem. So this theorem has been proved and reproved by numerous uh, practitioners. And here's a very compact form of the theorem. The dual system sigma bar, that was our notation for the dual of the original system sigma, is observable. If and only if the original system sigma is controllable. Okay. Now, if we go back one result that uh, the fact that sigma being controllable is equivalent to the module M having no torsion, then we have a natural question. Does observability have an al algebraic counterpart? So if we want to approach this, we'd better go back to torsion and using the work of control theorists, try and find a notion dual to torsion. So let's review the, uh, the definition of the torsion. Torsion was introduced a long time ago, around 1900 by Poincaré. So this is uh, very well described in uh, Diodonais' History of Algebraic Topology. So what uh, Poincaré observed is torsion and the homology group. Now we do have 
uh, dual notion of co-torsion, but that came almost 120 years later. So in our joint work, in joint work with my former student, Jeremy Russell. So now I want to explain. So we recall the definition of torsion, and then we'll use a functorial approach to come up with a dual notion. Okay, so redefining torsion. So let's go back to abelian groups. That's where that notion originated. So over Z, for any abelian group, equivalently any Z module A, the torsion is the totality of all elements, small a and capital A, which can be annihilated by non-zero integers. So here's the formal definition of torsion. So everyone saw a torsion abelian group, Z mod N, as opposed to Z, which has no torsion. So that's the definition of torsion, and it applies to any commutative domain. So given a module of a commutative domain, the definition of the torsion of the module will be exactly the same, except that the annihilating elements will be taken from the domain rather than from the ring of integers. Does that answer the question? Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here's an equivalent description of torsion through localization. So here's a very simple observation. So what we do is we look at Z as sitting inside the field of rational numbers. Rational numbers, well, that's, they also, it's also an abelian group and Z sits inside. And what could you do? Well, if you need, to compute the torsion of a module A, all you need to do is to tensor this embedding with a module A. A tensor Z going to A tensor Q. Let's call the embedding IOTA. So this is just A tensor IOTA. And the kernel of this embedding, and there will be a kernel because the tensor product is not left exact. So in general, so the kernel of this will be precisely the torsion submodule of A. So colloquially speaking, the torsion is the kernel of the localization map. But now look at this interesting uh, observation. Uh, what is Q? I already told you this is the field of fractions, but there's another description of Q. Q is what is known as the injective envelope of Z. So this is the smallest injective Z module containing Z. And the notion of injective envelope makes sense over any ring doesn't matter whether it is a commutative or non-commutative, a domain or not a domain, etc. So this prompts us to introduce 
a very general definition of torsion. So this general torsion Let's call it S of A. How do we define it? Three-step procedure. We are working over an arbitrary ring. Lambda is an arbitrary ring. So we view lambda as a left module over itself, and A will be a right module over lambda. So what do we do? We take the left module, the regular left module, and embed it into an injective container. It doesn't matter which one, you can take the injective envelope or you can take anything you like. Just make sure this is injective. Then what do we do? Exactly as above, we'll tensor the sequence with A. So this is, if we call this embedding iota, then we have A tens iota. And what's next? We'll just take the kernel and call it S of A. So the new torsion is defined as the kernel of this map A tens iota. And now that we managed to redefine torsion, by the way, this torsion works for any module over any ring, and it has a lot of good properties, but that would require a separate lecture. And now I would bring in functors again. So another functorial digression. So let's fix our notation. So lambda is again a, a ring. We have the category of left and or right modules. We have the category of abelian groups. And we're gonna look at functors from modules to abelian groups. And we will be working in an additive context. So we assume that F is an additive function. Okay, at this point, I would like to mention the word derived. You might've heard about derived functors of a functor. So let's look at the derived functors. And of all the derived functors of F, I want to concentrate on the zeroth derived functor. It, if you have seen this before, you may be surprised because in almost any textbook on homological algebra, the zeroth derived functor is isomorphic to the functor itself. I'm looking at the right derived functor and the first functor everybody talks about is home. And of course the right derived functor, the zero is right derived functor and home of, of home and the home itself are isomorphic. But in general, this is not the case. It is the case for home because it is left exact. But if the functor is not left exact, then you will not have an isomorphism, but you will always have a natural transformation from F to R naught of F. This is a fascinating subject. 
the properties of the zeros right derived functors. And you may be surprised to learn that uh, you are surrounded by this kind, this kind of transformation. The zeros derived functors are everywhere. But again, that requires yet another talk. What is, it, what is interesting here is to look at the kernel of this natural transformation. Let's denote it by F over line. And that kernel has a special name. F overline is called the injective stabilization. of F. And if you want to get a hold of this concept, uh, I can add that F bar is the largest subfunctor of F vanishing on injective modules. So there are intrinsic characterizations of such functors. And the next question is, can we compute? Uh, you may ask, why do you want to compute this? Again, this injective stabilization is everywhere. Uh, but I will get you another answer in just one moment. So computing F bar. It's a three step procedure. Say, suppose we want to compute F bar on a module. What do we do? Well, here's the recipe. Embed that module B into an injective. So this is an embedding. Two, apply the functor F. Let's call this iota. So we get F of B going to F of I by way of F iota. And step three, take the kernel. And that's exactly the value of the injective stabilization on the module B. That looks familiar. So immediate corollary is that the torsion, the new torsion of the module A is simply the value of the injective stabilization of the tensor product evaluated on the regular module lambda. We just set B equals lambda. And once again, I told you that this notion works for any module over any ring. And now we have a conceptual description of torsion using functors. That's the value of the injective stabilization of the corresponding tensor product functor, A tensor blank, on the regular module lambda. Just a word of caution here, uh, this, in this case, this injective stabilization exactly as the tensor product itself is actually a bifunctor. Uh, there is a, an active variable and there's an inert variable. The active variable is the one with which you take that injective container. The other one is just a label for your functor, A tens of length, so just A. So you have to injectively stabilize using the active variable, but then fix it at lambda. 
and then the other variable, the other variable A will provide you with torsion on your request for that A. The advantage of this approach is that now we can formally dualize the notion of torsion and define core torsion. How are we doing time-wise? You have about 10 to 15 minutes left. Okay, thank you. How to dualize core torsion? I'm sorry, how to dualize torsion? So let me break the page into two columns. On the left, we'll keep track of the defining steps for torsion. On the right, we will be recording the corresponding steps for core torsion. Step one in torsion was the choice of the functor F, and that was A tensor blank. What is the dual of the tensor profit? Well, you don't have to scratch your head. It should certainly be the home functor. Well, actually the contravariant home functor. So for F, we choose blank comma C. What was the second step? Well, the second step was to compute the injective stabilization of the functor F. Well, that was A tensor blank over bar. So what's the dual of this? Well, if we're computing the injective stabilization of the tensor product on the right, we should compute the projective stabilization of the home functor. So you can guess what the notation should be. That's F underline. And this would be, what is it? Well, surprisingly, you will have black blank comma C overline. What does overline stand here for? Well, this is the notation for home modular injectives. So you just take the usual home and then mod out the subgroup of all maps that can be factored through injective objects. It sounds a bit crazy. The projective stabilization of the home is home modular injectives, but this is due to the fact that we're dealing with a contravariant function. And finally, how did you define torsion? You evaluated the injective stabilization of the tensor product on lambda. So you had F of lambda equals A tensor lambda over line. Let me use the harpoon notation to remind you that lambda is the active variable. And that was our definition of torsion. So what is the corresponding step for core torsion? Evaluate the projective stabilization of the contravariant home functor on lambda. You will get lambda into C over bar. And then let's call this Q of C. And that's our definition of core torsion. And very briefly, uh, let's continue with the comparison of these two functors. So S was a subfunctor of the identity functor. What what about Q? Q is the a quotient of the identity. Well, there's a core kernel on the left, call it S inverse, and we get a short exact sequence. And likewise, there's a kernel on the right, 
and we get a short exact sequence. Now, this S here, remember, that's torsion. And torsion was related to the non observability. So this part here should then be viewed as the, I'm sorry, non, non controllability. And this part here as inverse should be viewed as the controllable part of the system. Now, if we switch over to core torsion, then it's very natural to suggest that the dual of controllability, what is it? Well, let's see how it works. For that, we need one more diagram, essentially the same, uh, same picture, but I need one more ingredient. This is the auslander grusen jensen duality. So again, we're dealing with a functor F from modules to a billion groups. I want to work with the so-called finitely presented functors. These are the functors, which are core kernels of maps between representable functors. Sorry, I need to change this. So this is your typical finitely presented functor. And now I want to switch from the category of all modules to the category of finitely presented modules. So for that, I use small m rather than capital M above. Finally presented modules. Okay, the Auslander Gross and Jensen duality goes between finally presented functors on small module category or the lambda opposite to a billion groups and finally presented modules on the category of small modules, finally presented modules on the original ring. A, B. So here we have the functor D and D is very easy to describe. Where does F go? It goes to D of F and D of F is defined on a module B as the class, in fact, a set of all natural transformations from F to the tensor product functor defined by B. So what are the properties of this functor D? D is contravariant. D interchanges home and tensor product. And thirdly, it's a very important property, D is exact. And now we have a theorem, D of Q equals S. So the dual, the auslander grusen jensen dual of co-torsion is torsion, which by the way, shows you that the classical definition of torsion is actually secondary to co-torsion. Co-torsion really rules the world. You can define torsion. This is, by the way, yet another approach to the notion of torsion through the notion of core torsion. Okay, and I guess I have to 
stop here, but maybe I can have uh, one more minute. Of course, yeah, take a few. Okay, so let's look at put everything together into one uh, diagram. So we have this short exact sequence. for core torsion and the short exact sequence for torsion. And now let's apply the Ausland Grusen Jensen transform to the top sequence. What do we know? The theorem above just told us that Q will be sent to S. That's where it goes under this duality D. What about the identity functor? Of course, it will go to itself. And now I told you that D is exact. So that forces Q inverse to go into S inverse. So we have a companion result that D of Q inverse equals S inverse. So what is S inverse? Philosophically speaking, S inverse corresponds to the controllable part of the system. What is Q inverse? Well, the conjecture is that that should correspond to the observable part of the system. And this duality between core torsion and torsion should provide uh, an algebraic analog of the duality between controllability and observability in control theory. And with this, let me finish. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, okay, so we have some time for questions now. Um, please feel free to either raise your hand in Zoom or unmute yourself or type something into the chat and I can ask. Um, and maybe will we wait for people to think of some questions? I, I have a kind of naive question I'd like to ask, which is how much of this story can be kind of applied to more general settings? And I guess there's kind of two um, directions that could take. One is like, what if instead of studying modules and whatever, you start looking at symmetric monodal categories or something like this? And the other direction would be, what if instead you start, you know, you forget about injective and projective and look at model structures or like some something like this um, is this something you've thought about at all uh yes in fact uh, there's an answer to your first question uh this was in the thesis of my student alex sorokin who jacked up basically everything well let's put it this way he provided a context for answering the question that you just posed so he worked with pro-functors, uh, derived pro-functors over, over cosmos. So these, uh, uh, the key part here is of course the Ausland, Agus and Jensen mm. duality, but the, this duality was actually known already maybe a good 15 years before, in the work of the Soviet topologist uh, Dmitry Fuchs. He essentially proved the same thing, but he, again, everything is uh, enriched. Fuchs worked with uh, the category of topo pointed topological spaces. Uh, the tensor product was replaced by the smash product. The uh, home functor remained the home functor, and he essentially had the, the same result. And a short time afterwards, he reproved that these results for a billion groups. So uh, Alex Sorokin uh, came up with a beautiful formalism uh, in his thesis, uh, with a beautiful formalism to consider all kinds of dualities in a similar fashion. And I see he is in the audience. Yes, I'm here. All right. 
Uh, I wanted only to add that auslander grusen jensen duality uh, is a part of more general duality, so-called generalized Isbel duality. Uh, classical Isbel, in a classical Isbel duality, uh, we are taking uh, right can extension and right can lifting uh, of identity profunctor. Uh, if we will take uh, identity profunctor is home. If we will change setting a little and uh, will have uh, analog of tensor product and will be taken ran and rift with respect to tensor um, by functor, then we'll uh, have a, a generalized type of uh, slender grusen jensen duality in an enriched context where you can take any cosmos you would like. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That's a great answer to the question. Um, so it seems that Mohammed has a question. Do you like to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Alex, for the wonderful talk. Um, yeah. uh, you defined even torsion using injectives. And uh, as you, of course, know that we're interested in constructive setting. So for general rings, you, uh, which you have a Grobner basis theory, then you would of course prefer free or injective modules rather than free or projective modules rather than injective modules. And there is of course a definition of uh, torsion using, uh, uh, um, so which is computable by just going to the double home. So you take the evaluation of M into the double home and the kernel is the yeah. torsion. And this is a definition that you can really work with. So you can, Compute it uh, using just projectives and res resolutions and so on. So, do you have a, a, a constructive approach for computable rings uh, um, for your co torsion uh, notion? Um, uh, let me point out that the definition that uh, you mentioned is due to BAS. And uh, recently I decided to call it the bass torsion. And it's absolutely crucial. However, it doesn't behave well, as you know, the torsion on the additive group of rationals is the whole rationals, although the classical torsion of that is zero. And in fact, uh, the torsion that we have defined is always a sub functor of the bass torsion. And it is the largest subfunctor of the best torsion preserving filtered call limits. So uh, this is the pathway for computing uh, with infinite modules. You can uh, you can uh, start with an infinite module, but actually do your calculations and find the presented modules and use this uh, call limit preservation property. As for core torsion. The situation is not clear. Uh, so S and, and, and the best torsion, they are in a symbiotic relationship with each other. For example, uh, as much as I love our definition, I cannot prove uh, that S is a radical functor without using the best torsion. It's, uh, I would be, extremely grateful if somebody shows me a proof which does not use the best torsion. So I know the best torsion doesn't behave well, but it is still a radical and it has a very simple description. We know how to describe those kernels. These are the points in the module where all linear forms vanish. We don't have an analog of uh, a best analog of um, of the best, uh, of the best, I'm sorry, how should I put it? Uh, a best counterpart of core torsion. I have no idea what this should be. And to add to the confusion, uh, let me add something really strange. Uh, there's also a notion of the defect of the factor. And recently I was able to compute the defect of uh, 
of the functor home modular projectives. And to my amazement, I did not get back the torsion that I already find, but I got back bass core torsion, even though from the functorial point of view, it doesn't behave as well. So apparently we have to live with this uh, misbalance. And uh, coming back to your question of computability, this is the first thing I hear, that how do you compute with, um, with injectives, which are infinite. And um, <clears throat> uh, at the moment, the only consolation I can offer is the following. Uh, there's a precise way to show that homological algebra associated with these functors is completely determined by the trace of injectives in the ring. So the ring could be an Ethereum. The injectives are still infinite, but what you're looking is maps from injectives into the ring and you look at the submodule generated by all those images. This is called the trace. So we're looking at the trace of injectives in the ring. If the ring is an Ethereum, you know it's finitely generated. That means somehow there are special elements in that trace coming from some special injectives. I understand this is far away from making injective a finitely presented module. For that, you have to assume something else. For example, that the ring is an art in algebra, then the injectives are finitely presented. But that's, uh, that's the limit as I see it at the moment. I see, so just one comment. Uh, I think when you, when the, what you call the bus torsion is free. You don't say it's torsion free, you say it's torsion less. Yes, exactly. I think this is the only uh, yeah. distinction so I know the, of the, uh, in the literature. That's right. I see, thank you very much. But you, you, you are optimistic that at some point it will become constructive. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What I learned from you and your group is that you have to redefine what it means to be constructive. Yes, true. And the philosophy, by the way, no, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, the philosophy in the paper of Fuchs was, if you don't have the duality at the level of modules, switch to functors. Yeah. Absolutely. It's duality of functors rather than the duality of modules. And uh, functors don't care whether you do them on finite modules or infinite modules. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, there was one small question in the chat, which I missed, which I will just mention now, um, which was about observability. When you talk about observability and you said, you know, it depended on just the output. So somebody asked whether, um, whether you could say anything about like memory observability as in, when you have access to the history of the system, not just the final output. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, can, I don't know anything about it because I um, don't work in control uh, systems. Now, remember that the output is yours, you determine. Uh, the, the, usually this is the information coming from sensors. Mm. Uh, and yeah, this is probably a good question. Uh, the issue with this, from my perspective of a newcomer, is that for each concept, uh, observability, uh, controllability, duality, there are several working definitions. And a great deal of papers is, are related to comparing uh, these different uh, definitions. So I cannot answer the question about the memory. Okay, that's fine. Thank you for saying something about it anyway. Um, okay, it's five past eight. So unless anybody else has any other questions, I suggest we thank Alex again for his lovely talk. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Um, I will now end the live stream.